Welcome to this whole life action hour. I'm Ocean Robbins, your host, and we are here today to talk about growing food. Now, gardening can be fun. It can be rewarding, and we all like to enjoy our meals, but there is a special kind of satisfaction that comes with food that you have grown yourself. Plus, homegrown food can be higher in nutrients. It can be fresher. They say to eat local. Well, how much more local can you get than your own backyard? And the flavor can be absolutely beyond anything you can find in a store. Freshly picked tomato. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to eat kale. Literally, I'd go on all fours and eat it like I was a deer. There's fun. There's there's connection. There's there's nutrition that's just unparalleled. And a lot of folks don't know how to start or how to do it right. So whether you're a first timer and you've never grown a sprout or you're an old timer who's been farming for years, I think you're going to find a lot of value today because today we're going to be joined by Charlie Nardozzi, who is going to be discussing gardening tips that will help you turn any yard space into a beautiful gardenscape. Now, this is a project of Whole Life Club, which is a Food Revolution Network ongoing membership community. And some of the questions that I'll be bringing to this interview come from our Whole Life Club members. Um, so let me introduce Charlie now. Charlie Nardozzi is a regional Emmy award-winning garden writer, speaker, radio, and television personality. He's worked for more than 30 years in bringing expert gardening information to home gardeners through radio and television and talks and tours online and in the printed page. Charlie delights in making gardening information simple and easy and fun and accessible to everyone. He's also a garden coach and consultant, teaching and inspiring home gardeners to grow the best vegetables, fruits, flowers, trees, and shrubs in their yards. His books include The Complete Guide to No Dig Gardening and Foodscaping, as well as Gardening for Dummies and Urban Gardening for Dummies, Vegetable Gardening for Dummies. Um, brilliant, amazing resource. And Charlie, we're just thrilled to have you here with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here, Ocean. Thank you. So let's just jump right in here. Um, when somebody wants to start gardening, if they haven't done it before, uh, what are some of the first few steps they should be uh, looking to take? Yeah, if you're starting to uh, grow your own food and you want to do that around your home or wherever you're living, there's a few things that you want to really keep in mind before you even start buying seeds and plants and all that other stuff. And the first is location, just like all the real estate people tell you. It's all about location. Well, it's kind of like that with a vegetable garden, too. Uh, you want to make sure you have a location in your yard or your area uh, that has full sun. Full sun usually means six to eight hours of direct sun a day. And it doesn't have to be all at one po point in time. It could be three or four hours in the morning, then some shade midday, and then three or four hours in the afternoon. Um, and that would work fine as well. But full sun will give you the most opportunity to grow the widest variety of vegetables from fruiting things like tomatoes all the way down to the lettuces and, and things of that nature. So try to find a spot in full sun. Also try to find a spot that's close to a water source. And that's something a lot of people don't really think about when they're siting a garden. But you're going to need to probably water your garden and it'd be a lot easier than taking a 50 foot long hose and dragging it across the lawn or a, across a driveway. If you had a, a water spigot or a water source right outside uh, that's right close to the garden, so it'd be easy to access that. And we could talk more about this too. You can save water too by using that kind of system, by using drip irrigation or using soaker hoses in your garden versus just overhead watering it, which wastes a lot of water. So that's another thing that you want to kind of keep in mind when you're doing that. Uh, other things that you want to keep in mind are, uh, you know, growing things in raised beds, you know, keeping things up. That's probably the simplest way to be really productive, especially in a small space. Because when you raise the beds up, you're bringing in some uh, good soil or you're creating good soil there. So you're going to have really healthy plants and you're really defining your garden space. And this is probably uh, critical for people who have pets that are outside or young kids. Um, and you're always trying to guide them away from running through the garden <laughs> or having the pets run through the garden. If it's a raised bed, it's going to be a little more defined as far as where the garden begins and where the play area begins. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit easier that way. And generally, you want to just keep it close by. Um, so the, the old adage, out of sight, out of mind, really holds true with a vegetable garden too. If you put it out somewhere, if you have some land and you put it out somewhere behind a garage or a barn or something like that, you're going to tend to forget about 
about it because it's not really been part of your habit in your lifestyle yet uh, to be going to the garden every day. But if it's right outside the door or right on the walkway leading to a driveway or something like that, every time you walk by it, you're going to stop, you're going to look, you're going to pull a few weeds, water a few plants, maybe grab a few cherry tomatoes, um, and you're going to be enjoying it that much more and the garden will be that much healthier too. Awesome. Thank you. You know, you mentioned irrigation and I, I was just thinking about how many people I know who water their plants by hand. They stick a hose out there randomly and then they forget for stretches of time and everything kind of shrivels up or doesn't do as well as it should. Um, and they waste a lot of water that way. Um, do you, are there, there's simple timers and things people can even hook up to a hose bib and then run a little line from that, that, that then will be automatic, right? Do you, do you recommend that even for a pretty small scale garden, people get invest in some simple device like that? Yeah, that would be the easiest way, especially if you're gardening in a really hot summer area that's dry, like a California, for example, a Mediterranean kind of climate, uh, where it's going to be dry all summer, you're not going to get much natural rainfall, so you're really going to have to stay on top of the watering. And like I mentioned, if this is a new activity for you, you might just forget. You just kind of get busy with your life, and days go by, and you forget about the garden and watering it. If you get a little timer, like you were mentioning, Ocean, and attach that to the hose and to the faucet and just put it on so that it turns on 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever amount of time is necessary a day, you don't have to think about it. You know that that water is going to be delivered. And most importantly, as you're mentioning, you won't be wasting the water because when it's done, it'll turn off automatically. And if you use things like, I mentioned, the soaker hoses or drip irrigation, that's really going to focus the water near the roots of the plants. So you're going to have less water wasted and less water going all over the place, like on the leaves. And in some parts of the country, you get too much water on leaves, it'll lead to diseases and other problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about, can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of companion planting and also um, like... I know sometimes people will put onions or garlic or other things interspersed to help uh, push away insects because they create strong smells that insects don't like. Are those things people should think about? Well, yes, they are. And there's a lot of folklore around that. And there's many books been written on it. The old Carrots Loves Tomatoes <laughs> books, the Louise Riotti books, which I grew up with. Uh, a lot of that is folklore. Some of it works, some of it doesn't work. There is a book I just want to do a quick plug for, uh, which I think is a really excellent book about this whole topic of companion planting. And that's called Plant Partners by Jessica Walliser. And Jessica took the time and did a lot of research talking with scientists around the country who were experimenting with companion planting. And she came up with a whole list of different kinds of companions that work really well together. And some of them are really great ones to, to try in your garden. So for example, if you have problems with squash bugs, um, which are little bugs that often go on summer squash and winter squash, um, if you can plant nasturtiums in around those plants and let them grow up, the smell of the nasturtium doesn't necessarily repel the squash bug, but it masks the scent of the squash. So when the squash bug is looking to find a squash plant, it can't really sense it, so it keeps going by and you don't have the squash bug problem as much. So there are resources out there and, and definitely things, but in general, the more diversity you can have in your garden, uh, we started with a vegetable garden and now it's it's got all kinds of things in it. <laughs> it's got flower, perennial flowers, annual flowers, herbs in it, shrubs in it, all kinds of stuff. And what that does is create an ecosystem. And that's really what you want to do. And the more of an ecosystem you can create, the less problems you're going to have with those harmful bugs because you'll be attracting the beneficial ones to come in and keep it all balanced. Awesome. Thank you. Um, how important is it to grow pollinator attracting plants along with vegetables and or fruits? And, and which are some of your f favorites? And are there any that should not be planted near vegetables? Okay. Uh, so yeah, pollinators like companion plantings are, are kind of an essential thing to have in there. And that's why that diversity of having flowers and herbs, you know, one of the great pollinators I have in our garden are any of those umbel plants. Umbels are those flat plants like a Queen Anne's lace wildflower or a dill um, or um, even fennel when it goes up to seed. Um, and those are really great uh, 
pollinator and beneficial insect attracting plants. And we always grow extras of those in the garden and just let them go to seed. We don't even need to try to eat them um, because we know that by midsummer, they're going to be attracting a lot of these pollinators that's going to help pollinate the squashes and the melons, especially those plants in that cucurbit family that needs cross-pollination. Uh, you want to be able to attract those insects in there. And they're not just honeybees and bumblebees, but there could be all kinds of flies and other insects that will be pollinating the, the garden. So yeah, there's a lot of different types there. Uh, we integrated, like I mentioned, perennial flowers like Echinacea and Rudbeckia, which are good pollinator tractors. Um, anything in the Salvia family is really nice, or the mint family, if you wanna grow some mint, and letting that flower, oregano is another good one. These are all gonna attract different kinds of insects to the garden. And while they're there, hopefully they'll be finding your vegetables too and pollinating them as well. Thank you so much, uh, wonderful. Um, Tell us a bit about no-dig gardening. What are some of the advantages of this approach? Uh, can it be used in all different climates? And how does someone get started with it or transition to it uh, from an established bed? Sure. Yeah, no-dig is uh, the topic of a book you mentioned that I, I have recently wrote, A Complete Guide to No-Dig Gardening. Thank you for that <laughs> little plug. Yeah. Um, and no-dig gardening is great because it is a, a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just something in a temperate climate. In fact, some of the most... Uh, ardent practitioners of no dig are down in Australia, Australia, New Zealand, and that area of the world, uh, but also in England and in Europe. Uh, so it is applicable to warm climates as well as cold climates. And the whole idea behind no dig is just like the doctors have that oath where the first do no harm, that's the, the idea behind no dig. The first thing you want to do is not to harm the soil. Because what we found out is that the soil is not just a, a vessel to contain nutrients that you're going to add and water that you're going to add, but it's a living entity. There are microbes there. There's all kinds of creatures there beyond just the ones you can see, the earthworms and the, the beetles and the ground beetles and, and insects like that. But in a teaspoon of healthy soil, there could be over 4 billion microbes which is um, kind of a mind-blowing experience when I first learned that. It's like four billion. Um, but that's what happens when you start yeah. looking under a microscope and seeing all these bacteria and fungi and viruses and, and everything that's in there. And they're all working in conjunction with each other um, to create uh, not only a good, healthy soil, but a place where plants can take up water and nutrients better. So anytime that you turn the soil, till the soil, dig up the soil, you're disrupting that whole network of microbes that are there. And uh, a good way to really see the, that network is to go into a forest, a healthy forest, and scuff around a little bit underneath the trees. And you often will see these white hyphae kind of running all over the place. That's mycorrhizae, and that's one of the... Uh, fungi that are in the soil that help transport water and nutrients um, all around in that the forest area. And what researchers have found is that in the forest, the mycorrhizae is a highway so that the water and nutrients get shared and communication happens. And so a healthy tree might send more nutrients to a tree that's not so healthy. So there's actually a sense of intelligence almost in that forest where it's helping each other out. We can create that same thing in our vegetable garden uh, just by not tilling the soil or turning the soil, but allowing things like the mycorrhizae and the other natural networks to form so that the plants in your garden can stay healthier and grow stronger. And the best part of no dig is that it's less work for you. And I like that part. <laughs> you don't have to be stripping sod <laughs> and, and ripping out all this stuff that we uh, nor normally have been doing um, over the years. Uh, you're just building using organic materials that are, might be around your landscape. Um, chopped leaves and grass clippings from untreated lawns um, and hay and straw and uh some compost and things of that nature. You're just gonna be adding those layer upon layer. Um, and then on top of that, you add a little compost and then you're ready to start planting. And as all that breaks down, it's gonna create a rich soil that your plant's gonna really enjoy. Uh, and they'll be able to grow up and they won't be needing as much water and they won't be having as many problems with weeds, insects, or diseases. So that's a, in a nutshell, <laughs> some of the great things about no dig gardening. Thanks so much for that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, for people who don't have a lot of space to work with outdoors, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the best or easiest vegetables to grow in containers or in small spaces? And any thoughts about how to adapt to that sort of environment, say in an urban environment or someone who just doesn't have much external room? 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a lot of people are new to gardening, but living in an apartment or a townhouse or a small scale, scale um, house where there's just not a lot of outdoor space for it. So if you have a balcony, a deck, a patio, something like that, you can certainly grow a lot of your own food in containers. And when I say containers, I'm not just talking about containers on the ground, but hanging baskets is a nice way to save space and, and grow some of your own food. You can grow things like strawberries, for example, in baskets, or even some dwarf cucumbers in baskets. Or they have these cute little uh, micro tomatoes, small tomatoes that are small plants. One's called lasano, and they just cascade over in a hanging basket too, and they don't get too big. So it's a manageable plant. So you can use hanging baskets, you can use on the ground containers, you can use railing planters if you happen to have a metal or wooden railing around your deck or patio or balcony. Uh, you can get these containers that just sit on top of them almost like a saddle bag and you fill them up with potting soil and you can grow all kinds of greens and herbs and things that way. Or you can even have a wall garden, a vertical wall. There are kits you can buy uh, that would attach to a wall that would have spaces to grow a lot of different kinds of vegetables and herbs um, right outside your kitchen a lot of times. So there's a number of different ways to maximize the space. When you're looking at the vegetables, though, probably the best thing to do is look for vegetables is either to stay small um, or are dwarf in their nature and their growth habits. So probably the easiest one would be um, any of the lettuces or the leafy greens. You know, they stay small and if you use the what we call the cut and come again varieties, these are ones where you, instead of pulling the plant out, you just cut it off at the ground level, take the greens, have a salad, whatever, and it'll grow back again. And it'll do that a number of times before it exhausts itself. So those kinds of vegetables are really nice to have. Certainly Bush beans are really good, very productive. You get a lot of uh, beans out of a small space that way. There are even some of the smaller varieties of zucchinis you can get, you know, especially if you have an in, on the ground container that's pretty big. You can put a zucchini plant in there and you probably could get some zucchinis out of those. And I was mentioning the, the tomatoes, some of the dwarf tomato varieties that are out there. I mentioned Lozano is a really nice one. There's a number of them. One I think is called Little Fingers. These only grow up maybe two, three uh, feet tall. Um, so it's easy to put a little cage on them in a container. It keeps them uh, supported so they don't fly over and yet at the same time they continue to produce a lot of fruit. There's a, a term, a kind of a horticultural term called dwarf indeterminate. So indeterminate means those are like those big um, heirloom varieties, the brandy wines and the persimmons, those big varieties that plant just grows huge. Dwarf of course means a short plant. So they've crossed the two and what they've created, uh, they being the breeders of these plants, They've created this dwarf plant, maybe two or three feet tall, that continues to produce fruit all summer long. So unlike a lot of the older dwarfs that just would kind of peter out after a little time, these continue to grow and produce fruit. So that's something to look for if you're looking mm. especially for tomatoes. Wow. What about for people who are very aesthetically minded and maybe they want to impress the neighbors or just look, give a good impression? And we're talking here about like front yard gardening, maybe. Um, what are any tips or suggested suggestions for really ways to add a lot of beauty with gardening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my foodscaping book that you also mentioned, thank you very much, uh, that book I talk a lot about uh, or edible plants that are very ornamental in their, their qualities. Uh, so in a front yard area where you have some raised beds, you know, you might want to plant things like the Bright Lights Swiss chard. Bright Lights Swiss chard is a whole mix of different colored Swiss chards that have yellow and pink and red and white ribs to them with their green leaves. So they're a very attractive plant uh, to have in the landscape. You can also grow things that are just naturally attractive. One of the things I always talk about, especially in that Foodscape book, is to kind of change your, your viewpoint of vegetables. We always think of vegetables as being utilitarian, but not so much ornamental. Well, if you ever take a look at an eggplant plant, for example, especially ones with different colored uh, eggplant fruits on them, it's a beautiful little shrubby bush. Um, and it's in a really attractive plant in a landscape. The same is true with a lot of the peppers, the sweet and the hot pepper varieties that are out there. There's one called, uh, that has actually purple leaves on it, uh, which is called Pretty in Purple, uh, which is really kind of an attractive plant, even when it doesn't have the bright red fruits or the different colored fruits on them. So by doing a little research and looking around a little bit, you can start growing some really attractive plants in your landscape that are also going to have the benefit of creating food for you at the same time. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, 
What about for beginning gardeners? What are some of the easiest vegetables or fruits or berries to get started with? And what are some of the things that are kind of more in the advanced category? Sure. So some of the easiest things would be a lot of things I've mentioned so far. The leafy greens, the, the lettuces, uh, arugula is really a very simple one to grow. And that's especially nice in areas that might be cold, um, even in the spring and fall, uh, because it likes cold weather. It grows really well in cold weather. Uh, anything that, that's kind of that leafy green type, the Swiss chards, uh, kales, anything of that nature are great because you're not waiting for something to flower and fruit. So they're not have a, a, there's not a lot of a wait time. Time, a waiting time, and there's not a lot of work that you have to do to make sure it gets the pollination correct. Uh, so any of those are pretty nice. I think any of these uh, dwarf tomato plants that I was mentioning, I mean, especially the cherry tomatoes. I love cherry tomatoes. <laughs> Sun gold is my go-to cherry tomato. It's beautiful. Uh, but there's so many other di different ones out there that are uh, either red or orange or yellow in color. They have different flavors to them. Um, and, and if anyone's ever grown a cherry tomato, uh, they, you very much know that it produces a ton of fruit. So if you're looking for a lot of bang for your space, uh, grow some cherry tomatoes. That's a really nice one to grow. And they're pretty easy to grow too. Uh, I mentioned bush beans they are really nice. Uh, small plants, again, a small space uh, type of plant that works really well on a deck or a patio um, and produces a ton of fruit in a small area. So I think things like that and, and, and herbs like basil is another one um, that will give you a lot of satisfaction even if you're not on top of gardening and taking care of it as, as much as you really need to. Got it. Thank you. I will say on the advanced category, I'm going to have to put artichokes. <laughs> um, I live in California where we can grow artichokes, but yep. my goodness, are they challenging. They get infested with ants and there's just a lot. It takes some care. I have, I have not nailed that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, artichokes can be hard sometimes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. There's a number of plants that are kind of like that. You know, anything I was mentioning, like melons, for example, for me in being in Vermont, yeah. it's cold. So it's really hard to get yeah. melons to grow fast enough and ripen before it gets too cold for them. So it kind of depends on where you are. In the yeah, country. you have to nail that perfect planting moment when there's yeah. no more frost. But it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> who knows when that'll be. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, we got some questions from our Whole Life Club members I'd love to okay. turn to. Thomas said um, a couple questions on composting. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on using Bermuda grass clippings? My concern is getting Bermuda grass started in my raised bed garden. Yeah, so that is a legitimate concern. I would be uh, very cautious with using any kind of grass, but especially a Bermuda grass. They can spread pretty quickly. Uh, and especially if you don't mow the lawn often enough so that the Bermuda grass starts to seed. So if it sets seed and then you're putting the seed in your uh, garden, that's not going to be a good thing. But Bermuda grass also can set roots from those little um, runners that go out too. So I'd be just really mm -hmm. careful using something like Bermuda grass. You know, it's more of a warm season grass. Um, you could try some other types of grasses uh, if you have that available for you. Um, or if you are going to try to use it, maybe try to compost it down first, it's especially if you can do a hot compost that will kill some of those seeds so that when you do put it in your garden, you're not going to be putting a weed in your garden too. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thomas also said, your opinion on using composted hay or straw. I have no way of knowing if pesticides were sprayed on the fields where it is harvested. Do you think it's safe once it is a year or two old as I'm trying not to contaminate my soil, preventing the germination and growth of my seeds? But living in central Texas, I want to mulch around my rows of plants to help conserve the water. Last year's early hot weather destroyed my tomatoes and green beans before we got any real production. Yeah, and that's a legitimate concern. You know, it's always nice to mulch using any kind of organic material like the hay and straw and grass clippings from untreated lawns and chopped leaves and things of that nature will help not only preserve the moisture in the soil and stop weeds from growing, but it also is going to break down and feed the plants too. It's a form of fertilizing. But you do have to be careful about the source. And if you don't know where that hay or straw is coming from, you don't know where the farmers that are harvesting it and what they might have sprayed in those pastures uh, to keep weeds out, then it might be something that you really would have to uh, be cautious about using. Uh, you can do tests of it if you make a compost out of it, especially. I know in Texas, a lot of the land-grant universities, the state universities like Texas A&M, um, they have soil uh, testing labs. 
and you could maybe contact them and see if you could send them a sample of compost you made from that hay or straw or maybe even the plant tissue itself to see if it has any contaminants on it, any kind of chemicals, herbicides is what you're really uh, concerned about, uh, that might be on it that would be harmful to your plants. Uh, so that's one, one route to go is to get some things tested. The other, as you are mentioning, is to, to, to wait a while, wait a year or two, and that will work with some chemicals but not all chemicals. So that's the thing. Uh, without knowing what's on those organic materials, it's going to be hard to really know if you've if a lot of them have dissipated after a year or two. So I would be cautious about it. And maybe see if you can do a little testing to see uh, exactly what's on there, especially if this is a a big source of mulch uh, for you. Got it. Thank you. Um, Ian said we have a small backyard that faces west, and we live in Wisconsin. We can't put in a raised bed at this time. Is there anything high yield we could put in a few buckets or pots that might grow for us? We've already touched on this a bit, but anything more you yeah. would add for Ian? Sure. Well, I mentioned arugula. I love arugula. I grow, I'm here in Vermont. It gets really cold here. <laughs> we have an unheated greenhouse that I usually use on the shoulder seasons, but I've got arugula growing in there and it's growing in a bed and I cover it over with a row cover and I'm still picking arugula in January from this unheated greenhouse in Vermont. So arugula is just a tough plant, and I think you mentioned he was um, in Wisconsin. Uh, so we've got similar yeah. weather to what I have here in Vermont. So that might be a nice plant to, to grow on, like I said, call the you know, shoulder seasons, the spring and fall, uh, early in the spring to get something out there so you get some nice taste of greens. And there's nothing like a great arugula salad from fresh from your garden that hasn't been hit by much heat, so it doesn't get very uh, bitter or very uh, spicy. Um, or in the fall is another time to do it. And that's what we did with our greenhouse is we planted it probably in October or November. Um, and we've been eating arugula ever since. So that's a great one for a container or a small space too, because you can cut it and it'll grow back again. Uh, baby carrots are fun. Uh, you know, you don't really think of if you had a five gallon bucket, how many carrots you can get out of that, but you can get a lot. <laughs> and especially if there's those little ones, like little fingers is a variety and thumbelina is another a dwarf variety. Uh, so that could be kind of a fun thing uh, to have growing in, in there. And then I mentioned, of course, basil earlier too. Any of those leafy green things where you're picking just the leaves to eat. Um, those are the kinds of plants that will continue to put out, put out a lot more greens um, so that you can enjoy them for sometimes weeks on end. Um, and they're very productive that way. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, Nina said, I live in an apartment with a small balcony fully exposed to the elements, extreme heat, wind, and rain with no cover. Do you have any suggestions as to what edible potted plants can thrive? I've tried a few and most didn't survive. When our potted kumquat trees leaves are curling and we have a problem with ants. Hmm. Do you have any idea what attracts the ants? Dying well, uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll answer the first question there uh, about what to grow. That's a, it's a tough situation. I know I know some people um, either in, here in Vermont who live up in, in two or three stories off the ground and have balconies like that. They're west facing. They get a lot of sun, really intense sun, a lot of wind and rain. And um, it's tough to grow plants there. So you need to look for tough plants. And I'm assuming, again, we're still talking about edibles that she's interested in. Uh, one gr plant that I yeah. grow every year that I, I think is great, especially if it's in a protected spot, is lemongrass. And lemongrass, if you like Asian food at all, especially Thai food, um, it's one of the key ingredients in a lot of Thai cooking recipes. Uh, and it's a beautiful plant to grow, and it's easy to grow, and it has that lemony flavor that you can make tea out of it, and you can do a lot of things with it. Um, and it's a tough plant. Mm. Uh, so that's one I could think of. You could try rosemary. Rosemary is another kind of a tough plant if you're in a warm enough climate uh, for it. That'll do okay. And I mentioned earlier about mint. Now, mint, of course, is... Uh, kind of an yes. invasive plant. It goes all over the place. But if you're just putting it in a container, that's the best way to grow it because it can't go anywhere. It's just going to kind of flop over the edge of the container and you can just harvest it as you need it. So plants like that that seem to be hard to kill, <laughs> the ones that you often will see like taking over gardens, those will be the ones you want to look for in those extreme situations that get a lot of sun, a lot of rain, a lot of wind, uh, a lot of conditions that most plants will struggle to survive with. Yeah. Lastly, I'll say uh, I would just add that uh, there are situations where taking it indoors can make sense too. Mm. You know, um, 
and there's different ways to do that. And the simplest is literally sprouting in your windowsill with sprouts. But, you know, you can also have container plants indoors. And that's obviously a much more controlled environment. They obviously have to have, you know, some grow lights or some form or be close to a window, depending on the plant. But just wanted to add that. Yeah, yeah. And as um, far any as any thoughts, the... any thoughts? Yeah, ants. Oh, yes, the ants. <laughs> yes, I was just going to mention that. Uh, as far as the ants in her kumquat, uh, the ants are probably there because you have a nice, well-drained soil, which you want to have for citrus. Uh, but And they shouldn't be causing too much problem unless they start farming the aphids that you have on your kumquat. So you might want to look and see if you have aphids on your kumquat leaves um, because that, that would be something that they'd be interested in, in actually moving them around the plant and making it worse. Uh, but in general, ants are not much of an issue in a garden setting uh, like this. But if it's really bothering you, you simply can just pull that plant out and knock all that soil off and repot that kumquat. Um, and depending on where you are, I'm kind of assuming you're in a kind of a warm climate, maybe a California or Southern California or something like that. Uh, you know, this time of year going right up until February, March is probably a good time of year to do that kind of transplanting before the weather starts getting warm and really hot. Uh, so that would be one way to try to get mm -hmm. rid of those ants. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Joan said we just moved to a small lot where we can't compost easily. Any tips mm -hmm. on how to manage all the kitchen waste that we're used to throwing on a compost pile? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, there's some places, I know in Vermont, they actually mandate it that you can't put your kitchen waste in the, the trash any longer. You have to either compost it yourself or send it off to someone else to, to compost. And that might be one option, depending on where, where they're living. If they know a local farm or a market gardener somewhere who's doing active composting, they might be fine with you bringing a five-gallon bucket every week or two and just dumping it into their compost. That might be something that uh, would fit in as far as taking care of all the food waste you're creating and helping out the local farmer. Uh, so that's one possibility. If you do have a garden, if you do have enough space for a garden, you can do a thing called sheet composting. And sheet composting literally means in the rows between the beds, you're digging them down a little bit and you're burying your compost in it. You just put the soil back on top of it. So by doing that, you're creating uh, much richer soil over time uh, and you're finding a place to put those food wastes so you don't have to throw them out and have a, a nice use for them. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so um, let's see, I guess next next question is going to be from Edgar, who said, I love greens and I love them organic. Any universal tips to grow greens organically, especially when it comes to disease control using chemicals? Yeah. So with a lot of greens, you know, you really shouldn't have to be using many chemicals to get them to grow well and to keep disease off of them. If you just follow those basic tenets I mentioned earlier in the show, where we're talking about a raised bed, healthy soil, either done with a no-dig system or you just brought the soil in that was already a healthy mix of topsoil and compost, uh, really well-drained soil, a lot of diseases like um, soil that really stays wet and doesn't drain well. In fact, uh, one of the things I learned about some of the organisms that cause a lot of those rot diseases and those wilt diseases, like on tomatoes and some other plants and, and uh, potatoes, is that those diseases are anaerobic diseases, meaning that they need a real wet soil and anaerobic soil with not much oxygen in them to thrive. So if you have a light soil that has a lot of oxygen in it, you're not going to have those disease problems in your garden. They're just not going to be able to survive under those conditions. Uh, so that, those are some of the things you can do is make sure you have healthy plants that are growing well, maybe space them a little further apart so you get good airflow around the plants so the leaves will dry out and not have a chance of getting a disease on them. And if you do notice some diseases, uh, mildews and things like that, you can use an organic spray if you do have to spray and like bio neem. Uh, neem oil has been a proven uh, sp spray that you could use to thwart a lot of different diseases in the garden. Uh, so that w and that's a very safe thing too. Neem, uh, the neem tree and the neem seeds where the oil is extracted from are actually food for animals. And uh, I think in India, you, they make toothpaste out of neem. <laughs> so uh, it's a very safe to put in the garden <laughs> and spray on your plants. Awesome. Uh, Khalees said, I'm surrounded by squirrels, chipmunks, mice, and rats. Some of these, along with birds, eat all the fruit off my trees before the fruit is ripe. I'm sure they will eat all the plants in a garden when I'm ready to plant a garden. What are your suggestions for keeping food in a garden for the humans? 
<laughs> Sounds like you live in a an, in a zoo or something. I mean, all these animals. All over the place. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't even mention rabbits, but I'm going to add that to the mix. Put the rabbit and bunnies. the deer too. Let's put the deer in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have a lot of animal pressure, and I know a lot of suburban and urban areas have this because people have moved into the natural habitats and some animals like the squirrels and the rats and a lot of the ones she mentioned in the birds have adapted to human behavior. So they're able to live side by side and of course are always looking for food. So if you're trying to grow a, a garden under those settings, uh, you really have to be proactive before you even start planting anything. And I would suggest looking at a lot of these different kinds of cages and barriers that are out there. Uh, there are different cages you can buy. I know a company um, in Vermont that's a national company called Gardner Supply Company has one, some that are, are pretty big cages that kind of made out of a chicken wire, but they go right over a raised bed. That will keep a lot of animals from getting into your garden without you having to worry about sprays or fencing or any of that other stuff. And you can simply just open them up and keep working the garden and harvest as you want to go along. So that's one kind of material. Another one is a, the row cover I mentioned earlier when I was talking about growing the arugula in the greenhouse. That is actually a, a good way to cover over a bed, especially if you can create some hoops made out of metal or PVC pipe um, over your raised bed and just lay this nice cheesecloth-like material on top of it and anchor it down with boards or stone. Um, if you do that when you first seed things or first transplant and the animals don't know there's something good in there, they're not going to work really hard to get into that bed. It's when they find out there's something good there, then they're going to make a special effort to get in there. And that's why it becomes almost fruitless to kind of keep uh, doing that. So that would help um, for your fruit trees and berry bushes. Netting is a good thing to do. And again, put it on early uh, before all these uh, animals get out there. There are some little home remedy sprays when I've... Uh, I've used and have heard people use successfully is using grape flavored Kool-Aid. Those packets of Kool-Aid, maybe you remember them as a kid, you get them in the grocery store, you put four packets in a gallon of water and you spray it on your, your fruit, on your fruit tree as it's ripening. And what it is, is because of the sweetness of it or whatever it is, the animals don't like it. The birds don't in particular don't like it. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a safe way. Of course, you want to wash all that off before you eat them, because, unless you want to eat grape flavored blueberries. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, you can use things like that. Some home remedy things may work as well. But I think the idea with barriers and cages over different plants, it may not look as aesthetically pleasing as you'd like, but it may be the most effective way to keep the animals away and, and not really harm them. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Mary said, I have an indoor tower garden that I love. The last two times I started seedlings for the garden, my sprout rate was very low, despite ordering brand new seeds. Any tips on starting seedlings in a tower garden? Yeah, so uh, Mary, you've got the right idea by getting fresh seed, new seed. If you have an issue with saving seeds uh, year to year, it's always good to get some a new seed that's really going to germinate well. And then it, it would be nice to have some kind of seed setting start a, a system um, indoors. And uh, this could be a little grow light system. There are small ones that are really nice to use now, uh, really easy to use with some containers, with some germinating mix. So when you're looking for soil for those containers to start the seed, uh, look for something called seed starting mix or germinating mix. That's one that has the regular materials in it, but it's been milled down so it's very light and fluffy. So it's really easy for seeds to germinate. And then most importantly, you want to keep it evenly moist. Uh, so either by watering it or checking the water every day. Um, when it starts to be too wet though, you don't want to water it so often that it's wet because that can cause seed to rot too. So you want kind of a happy medium with the watering of them. There are these systems where they have a reservoir underneath the seed starting tray with a little um, capillary wicking mat that goes underneath it and then you just place your, your pots on top of that and then the moisture naturally goes up and through osmosis goes through and then into the containers and keeps the soil evenly moist and that works really well because then you don't have to remember to keep watering it and see how things are doing. But if you could do some of those things uh, and try that out, I, I think you'd have better success with getting things to germinate and getting things to grow so that when you transplant them in that tower, they'll be in much better shape. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Tammy said, uh, my husband is actually the gardener with a green thumb. I'm <laughs> not. We live on Lake Erie in Ohio, so our growing season is in a temperate zone and limited. We'd like to try new vegetables. Any suggestions for Tammy's uh, location? Ha, huh. new vegetables. Um, okay, well, I'm not sure what you're growing now, so I'll just throw out some vegetables that um, are kind of more unusual, not something that everyone grows. Uh, leeks are a great one in the onion family. Uh, very mm. winter hardy, very cold hardy. So if you're in Ohio near Lake Erie, you get a lot of cold wind off the lake. Um, and that's something that you'd plant in the spring as little seedlings and then just let them grow all summer. And then by the fall, you can just leave them in there. And that's another one I was mentioning about the arugula that's very winter hardy in the sense that it'll, it'll freeze and then they'll thaw and you can still harvest the leeks and cook and use them. Uh, so that's a, that's a nice one. Another long season uh, plant is Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts has kind of gone through a whole new, uh, revolution in, in interest, you might say. <laughs> you see crispy Brussels sprouts on all these menus in restaurants all over the place. And people love Brussels sprouts. And they're really easy to grow. Uh, but it, again, it is an, another long season vegetable. That you start in the spring and you really don't get any of the sprouts until you get into September, October, November. Um, but because it's such a winter hardy vegetable, it'll last a long time in the garden. And you can just go out and pick them uh, around the holidays uh, just for use whenever you need to use them. Uh, so that's another kind of fun one. Kind of something else in that same realm is kohlrabi. I'm not sure if you ever tried kohlrabi, but it's in that brassica broccoli family. And it grows very unusual in that it grows up and it forms a, a bulb, almost like a small baseball size bulb, um, right on the soil line. And that's what you end up eating. When that gets big enough, you, you chop off the roots, you chop off the top, you've got that, and you chop it up. And it's got kind of a mild uh, broccoli flavor to it, great for dips and things of that nature. And again, another easy one to grow. So I think those cool season vegetables in those families I mentioned would be nice ones to experiment with and play around with. Great, thank you. Um, Cheryl said, every year I lose my squash crops to squash bugs. What can I do to eliminate these pests? Or is there a variety of squash that might be more resistant? Yeah, so squash bugs uh, are a big problem uh, and they will go after pretty much any variety. I don't think there's certain varieties of squash that squash bugs don't go after. I've seen them on all different kinds of squash in our garden. Uh, one, some of the key things to do is that, you know, I mentioned early, in, earlier in the show about uh, having the garden close to your house so you go and you look at it more frequently. That's especially true when you're trying to do pest control. And especially with something like a squash bug, because what the bug does is it lays eggs on the undersides of the leaves and they're copper colored eggs, usually arranged in a formation, you might say, very linear um, between the veins of the leaves. So they're very obvious if you took the time just to turn the leaves over and look. And if you see them there, you can either crush them with your fingers, or if you're a little skittish about doing that, just take a scissors and cut them out. Even if you leave a little hole in the leaf, it's okay. But that's going to stop that generation of squash bugs from uh, going from just a few of them laying eggs to like a whole horde of them eating everything, uh, including the leaves and the flowers and the fruits. So that's one thing you, you can try to do. And the other thing I mentioned when you're, we were talking, Ocean, about... Uh, companion planting is to grow nasturtiums. Grow a bunch of different nasturtiums, the, the, the cascading, trailing types of nasturtiums all around your squashes and make sure you get them out really early, even yeah. before the squash are there. So you, you have a good uh, crop of nasturtium leaves and flowers going when those squash bugs start coming into your garden. And they mask the scent of the squash so the squash bug has a harder time to find the plant. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, Claire is the uh, dog parent, and <laughs> she's asking for any advice on dog and garden information, mm. including issues like dog peeing where they shouldn't be, eating plants they shouldn't be. Any thoughts on how to tend to dogs and have them coexist with gardens well? Yeah, um, a well-trained dog uh, <laughs> is a good thing to have, but not all dogs are easily trained. So uh, I always encourage people if they have pets, especially if they have like a backyard where the pet roams around and there's gardens there too, is to somehow segment or, or fence off the area where the garden is or the area where the dog is, either way, um, so that the dog learns, this is where I go do my, my business over here, um, and these are the plants that I, I'm not going to touch over there. Uh, so a little bit of training, just kind of separating things and not keeping the dog in a place where it can easily just run right through the garden or 
would just naturally pee on the garden because that's what they like to do. Uh, but as far as plants and things go, you know, they're, there's really not a lot of plants, maybe prickly plants they wouldn't be too interested in. Um, but for the most part, they're going to be uh, testing and chomping on all kinds of plants. Uh, so it, it's good to somehow separate them out so that they, the garden has its own space and the dog has its own space. Oh, fabulous. Well, Charlie, before we wrap up here, I just got to ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. um, why do you love growing food? Ha. Um, I love growing food because it gets me out in nature, which is a, a good reason to have a garden because it's a, a sure way to make sure you're outside and enjoying what's going on around you and becoming more observant about what's going on around you. And I just love being out in nature, always have, ever since I was a little boy, running around uh, my Italian grandfather's farm. Um, always just love being out playing in nature and running around and, and watching and looking at things. But also I love to eat. <laughs> Being an Italiano, Italian-American, um, I love Italian food and grew up with great Italian food and all these great dishes. And it's really fun to have fresh produce out of the garden, um, especially unusual things, too. You know, I grow certain uh, peppers, for example, that are Italian heirloom peppers that you don't really find in places. So you can really start experimenting with some unusual plants that are out there, some great seed companies that carry these varieties. And, and it'll make a difference in what how you cook and how you eat. And it just makes for um, a happier life. You know, it's a very simple life, but it's a really nice one in the sense that you're in touch with nature, you're in touch with fresh food that's healthy and it's good for you. You're getting some exercise too, and you're sharing it with your family and your friends. Sounds like a pretty good existence. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Well, we've been talking here today with Charlie Nardozzi, a regional Emmy award-winning garden writer and speaker and radio and TV personality. Charlie is the author of some fantastic books. So if you want to go further or take this deeper or have his wisdom to guide you on your journey, check them out. The Complete Guide to No Dig Gardening, Foodscaping, A Practical and Innovative Way to Create an Edible Landscape, Urban Gardening for Dummies, and Vegetable Gardening for Dummies, all available from, from Charlie. Uh, it's been so wonderful to have this time with you, Charlie. I just want to thank you for your wisdom, for your leadership, for helping inspire so many people to reclaim their relationships with food and soil and land. And uh, what, what a gift you're bringing to the world. Oh, thank you very much, Ocean. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for doing these kinds of podcasts. They really help people out. Absolutely. It's been great to have this time with you. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club.